And good evening, everyone. John Russell. Mike Mikoff of M7 Sports here for another <laughs> another week. Yeah. Uh, Detroit uh, D Detroit treated you uh, treated you pretty badly. I, I see. Uh. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> last week I asked my wife Pam. I said, you know, watch the show. What'd you think of the show? How did we sound? How did we look? She goes, you looked and you looked good. You sounded good, but you didn't have any eyebrows. <laughs> oh, you took care of that. So I got eyebrows now, honey. So how do I look? <laughs> Actually, this kind of doubles as kind of my clown look because if anyone saw my predictions last week, I looked like a total clown. <laughs> Ten and eight, I think I was, and it was like, I mean, I bombed on so many games. Like, all the big ones I missed, and it wasn't even close. So I'm taking my medicine now, everybody. And, yes, I'll take these crazy glasses off. But, uh, yeah, that's – and I figured I'd throw you guys for a loop with that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our second week of West Michigan first in ten. We are Cal-less today. Cal is uh, a little bit under the weather, so – it's just uh, three of us here uh, today, so um, I tell you what, why don't we get started in the uh, OK Green, and uh, boy, I tell you what, those Eastsiders uh, did not treat uh, our Muskegon schools very well at all uh, this past week. Let's start out with the Cast Tech uh, taking on Muskegon, 49-14 to 14 at historic uh, Hackley, uh, Hackley Field. I know you were there for that one, and uh, again, one of the things where we say not necessarily surprised that Cast Tech defeated Muskegon, but man, as I was listening to that game when I was driving around, I thought, holy smokes, I did not expect that. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, just to simplify it as much as I can, Cast Tech was just big, strong, fast, well-schooled. I mean, they were just, and I don't know, if, if they can play better than that, I, I wouldn't want to be the team on the other side of it because they played awfully well. And, you know, they're, they got a great junior quarterback, a little lefty, Sean Mumfield, and he was just right on the money all night long. I don't. I think it kind of summed it up for Muskegon. Uh, Cast Tech was up 40, what was it, 35-7, a few seconds left in the first half, and they had the ball on like the, what was it, the 20, the, maybe the 16 is what it was. They're going to set up for a field goal. Then they got a false start, and then, and then another one, and they're like, you know what, forget it, we're going to go for it. Yeah. So they threw it up, the quarterback scrambled, he threw it up, and the kid caught it, got his feet in, somehow caught the ball, and that just kind of summed it up for Muskegon right there, all in that. That they were just outstanding. And Muskegon, I'm not sure how much of it was them. Obviously, if some of it was them. But, right. I mean, Kestek played so well. They got a new coach and Marvin Rushing, and he was in complete control. They just looked really good. Your thoughts on, uh, on that one? Yeah, so most of us in the Muskegon area media picked Muskegon to beat Kestek or make it. I, I don't know if there was a little bias involved <laughs> in that. But, man, that was, from looking at it, it was never competitive. I mean, Kestek led 35 nothing at one point, and they had a running clock the entire second half. One of the bright spots, I think, for Muskegon that's came in relief the last couple of games was uh, running back Jake Price. He had uh, six carries for 73 yards and a touchdown for him. So I think he's one of their young stars to really look at going forward. Well, and the, the, they had a, the running back was huge. He was like a guard at running back. I was watching uh, some of the replays of that. And, uh, and, and the left tackle. And the, yeah. <laughs> well, the running back. His running arm back, looked like yeah, a giant. Yeah. I made the comment on the sideline. I don't know if you remember Bully from River Rouge a couple yeah, years ago that yep. ran, ran against Muskegon. And that, he reminded me a lot of him. I'm like, I thought that kid graduated from River Rouge two years exactly. ago. Exactly. And then the Division One prospects that they had, I, I think uh, their, their offensive line, which was huge, have a whole bunch of Division One commits or, or folks that are close to committing to Division One too. So they, obviously, Division, you know, uh, you know, they are they are the real deal to say the least. So, um, but uh, yeah, we're hopefully the the Big Reds will be able to get back on track. It's not going to be easy. They're going to be playing uh, John Shillito and the vaunted uh, wing T against uh, Zeeland West. And uh, what are you thinking of this one? Uh, uh, Scott that's another tough one they don't have time to feel sorry for themselves they gotta right. get right back to work and traditionally Shane Fairfield teams have had a, done a good job against the wing tee um, last year Zealand West came to Hackley and controlled almost the whole game and then Muskegon scored late and then they had a 95 yard uh, school record punt return by Miles Walton to win it mm. basically you know the extra point won it but they kind of pulled that one out and and then Zealand West got knocked out of the playoffs because of COVID, so they could have maybe met in the playoffs again. But, yeah, it's going to be another tough one. Your thoughts, uh, Mike? Yeah, so like Scott said, Shane Fairfield has done excellent against wing T teams. In fact, I've heard multiple times that he's undefeated against wing T teams. But John Shillito is, in my opinion, the best in this state when it comes to this. If you watch any 
film or go to any Zealand West game, you'll notice they only run about 10 plays. That's it. Just because they run it so well and they practice those few plays really hard and are masters at it. And personally, I think this is going to be a really close game, but I'm going to give Zealand West the slightest of edges this week. And I think, uh, I think they finally knock off Muskegon. And, you know, when we talk John Chilito, we kind of the kind of the godfather of the wing tee, because when you talk about other teams that run the wing tee, usually uh, there's a coach that's been involved in the coaching staff of his or something like that. So much like Tony Anise, a lot of uh, disciples or a lot of the coaching tree or whatever Absolutely. it is with Chilito, you definitely get that, don't you? Oh, most certainly. And uh, just a little link. I, I think there might even be a link between Edwardsburg and Zeno West. When you watch Edwardsburg, mm -hmm. at least for me, they remind me a lot of Zeno West and a lot of the same principles, you know, kids who get in the weight room, just right. strong kids, and they run that wing tee really well. Yeah, when we did the Ed Edwardsburg uh, Montague game, uh, their announcers had told us that Kevin Bartz was, uh, again, a, a Shilato disciple. So mm -hmm. I guess if you're going to follow somebody, you're not, you're not exactly going to follow somebody that doesn't have a lot of success. So or even <laughs> if, you wanna, if you want to if you want to keep it around here, even uh, Orchard Views coach Fred Rademacher is a John yes. Shilato disciple. Exactly, and then coming back home for that. Um, your thoughts on, uh, on Zealand West Muskegon? You think they're going to bounce back? Yeah, yeah, that'll be a tough one. I mean, I think they got the good track record, but Muskegon's just a little bit different this year in that they're really young. Yeah. They're breaking in a lot of young players. They're breaking in a new quarterback. You know, Miles started the first game last year, but he's, you know, the starting quarterback now, and they've got a new offensive coordinator. So they're they're kind of adjusting on the fly. So it's it's tough. And But, you know, Shilato, I think they lost some guys on their squad too, but with them it's just a case of just plugging new parts into that machine that they've got. So it's, you know, it's – it's hard to bet against Muskegon in most cases, but it's going to be a tough one for him, I think. How about you, Mike? Another thing is that, you know, you could look at this as either a positive or negative. Take it how you want, but uh, Zeeland West didn't play last week. They had an open week, and they beat EGR pretty badly week one. But, you know, with those two weeks, you could either say, well, they lost a game, or you can say, well, they had an extra week to prepare. But I'm still going to go with Zeeland West. I think uh, they have what it takes to barely pull it out. And I'm going to take Muskegon because uh, I just think that they're they're going to rebound um, and and it's going to be tough. But I think they'll uh, uh, Zealand West is is not to cast tech, so I think it's going to be a bit of a <laughs> yeah. A this bit is of a true. Break. So yeah, this I'm is very true. That. Let's uh, go to the other uh, the other trip that was made to Detroit Mona Shores. We'll start with you on this one, Mike. Your alma mater, Mona Shores, taking on Detroit King and. Boy, Detroit King had about as much success with the Mona Shores as Cast Tech did with Muskegon. 40-19 to 19 was the final in that one. Yeah, so even though the game was tied at 13 midway through the second quarter, I think, uh, you could tell just from watching the game that it wasn't close. On either. I, I can truthfully say I don't think there was a position that Shores was better than King at. There were some matchups that went really well for Shores. Like, I thought the only two things that Shores did well – were the deep ball occasionally and outside runs. Both sides of the line couldn't go against uh, the King front. Uh, King's receivers ran all over Shores DBs. Uh, King had a pretty easy time running to the inside, running to the outside, where Shores never even got an inside running game going at all. Anytime they tried to run the quarterback or uh, you know hand it off up the middle, it never worked. And really, all the short scoring drives were off of penalties and kind of slowly moving the ball and struggling, even though they did score. And the only long drive was that one uh, in the second quarter that uh, passed from Mark Konechny to Jalen Vinton. It might have been the first quarter. It's tied at 13. Other than that, I don't really think they put together a quick drive that looked, you know, fluid in scoring. Scott? Yeah, um, just obviously getting – the updates, the tweets from Mike and retweeting and just kind of getting following it on my phone that way and then talking to Matt Koziak that night. It was, of course, they were just up against a really tough order. And then on top of that, King, I'm sure, had a lot of payback in mind because Shores took them down in the finals a couple years ago, and then they really put one on them last year, even though the score didn't look like it. It was That was a mercy rule type game. And, um, yeah, they were just – sounds like they were just enormous on the line. They, they were talented at basically every position and that was you know I think one of the things that stood out to me the most and I know it really doesn't have anything to do with the game was what Mike was able to capture after the game when he got a video of of Koziak playing catch with some young King fans young King kids it was really cool I mean I just thought to me that shows that you have your head kind of in the right 
place that you're you see they just took a 40 to 19 beating right and snapped a 19, 19 game winning streak, streak yeah. but yeah he's taken some of time out of his own day i mean he was like you tell me mike you were there but i think you told me that all the players are on the bus whatever and, yeah absolutely and matt yep. stays out there playing catch with these kids and chatting them up and stuff that was really cool i thought yeah, and I try to do those type of stories whenever I kind of see the opportunity. You know, uh, I had just got done interviewing him, and I was actually heading back to my car, and I saw I saw Koziak go out and just start throwing the ball with these kids, and I just thought they just lost, and he's out there, you know, still uh, with selflessly playing the ball play, or playing catch with them. I mean, uh, I love those type of stories, and even last year I. Uh, during basketball, I did a nice story on uh, David Ingalls, Kent City's basketball coach. Mm -hmm. After they got blown out by Orchard View, he went in Orchard View's locker room and gave him a speech about uh, how good he thought they could be and uh, some of the mo mottos he taught his team. So really, I love any time I get an opportunity to do those stories, and that one was really a special one. Well, this week, Mona Shores is going to take on Union, and this is not the Union team of the past. We had an opportunity to watch them play last uh, year when Don Fellows came over. Of course, Don Fellows, that name might sound familiar, had the great career over at Grand Rapids Christian and um, you know multiple playoff teams. And then, of course, before that, he was coaching with Anise at Muskegon. So he comes from that Tony, we talk about coaching trees, that Tony Anise uh, coaching tree. And I'll tell you what, he's got this Grand Rapids Union team believing uh, in themselves. And so it's, it's not going to be a case of Mona Shores just being able to throw their their cleats on the field and, and, and cash in a win, is it? No, it's not. And, well, I do think Shores will win fairly easily in this game. I have been saying all week that I feel like I'm living in an alternate universe because <laughs> you got Union, uh, Hart, and Muskegon Heights all at 2-0. <laughs> yeah. And you have Muskegon, Mona Shores, yeah. and Montague all at 1-1. One <laughs> one. So it kind of feels like an alternate universe. But I do love seeing those type of teams succeed, especially after so many down years. I think Union went five years without winning the game. And I'm, I'm so happy for Don Fellows and that program for what they've been able to succeed over there. And uh, I look forward to seeing them continue to build. But I'm going to go with Shores and a pretty lopsided one this week. Your thoughts, Scott? Yeah, I like Shores in this one. Don Fellows, Shores is another stop of his. Mm -hmm. yep. um, he was there too. So, you know, that, it's a great story to see them kind of rising a little bit and it sounds like their numbers are really good mm -hmm. and but I just think this is one of those ones that you know the winning the conference title is important to Mona Shores that's one of their big goals right that's that's the first goal every year because that's the first thing that comes sure they're the defending champs they want to win the conference again so you got to start with that and they want to get back on track and everything and so yeah I, I I like Shores in that one though I mean it's I think Union I'll be curious to see what they look like on Friday because that's the game I think I'm going to go to and that'll be technically my last night with them live, although that will kind of leak into Saturday, into Saturday afternoon, <laughs> probably by the time I'm done with everything. But it's, um, I'm looking forward to seeing that one. I think that's where I'm going to end up being. But, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Yeah, and I'll stay with the trifecta. I think it's going to be Shores, but I think, uh, you know, obviously this is not the union team of the past. I think they'll make things somewhat interesting, but I, I think that uh, Shores will be able to handle them, especially coming off a, a loss last week against a very tough uh, Detroit King team. Let's talk about uh, the Reese Puffer Rockets. They rebounded nicely after, uh, uh, well, they come back, they wound up uh, winning um, uh, to, against St. John's by the score of 19 to, to six in that one. We thought going in that they might have a shot against the St. John's team. Yeah, it kind of played out, I think, how if, if some of us thought. It was it was tight mm -hmm. most of the way through. I think it was six to six entering, entering the fourth quarter maybe and somewhere around around that range. And they ended up putting it away late. But, yeah, they had a big game from Brody Johnson, a sophomore, who had 202 rushing yards and 22 carries. And um, they just, you know, they got the job done. And, and you know, without jumping ahead and stepping on your toes, there, there's another – you know, winnable game coming up, and I'll let you you guys talk about that. And I know Mike's got thoughts on that game too, probably on the mm. on this current game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we said last week that St. John's is, uh, or that this is a must win for Reese Puffer, and St. John's is no slouch of a program. I mean, they've made the playoffs besides, la or last year everybody got in, but they've had a winning record out of 10 out of the so many other, and uh, you know, for Puffer to be able to get that win is huge, and I feel like it keeps their season alive and maybe gives them, you know, a little more confidence going into some of these tougher conference games. And like Scott said, Brody Johnson had a heck of a game with over 200 yards. 
and uh, yeah, I think that uh, they'll they'll take care of Wyoming and keep on going. And obviously, every every win that Reese Puffer can get is uh, is is golden right now. When you have you know Mona Shores and, and Muskegon in, in your conference, so it builds their their character and builds their confidence too. Let's talk about the OK Blue and the uh, Fruitport Trojans had a tough one. We knew this one was going to be tough going in. Uh, Cadillac, uh, a, a very solid team. Uh, Fruitport gave them battle 28 to uh, 12, and we'll start with you on this one, Mike. So Nate Smith said after the game that uh, he had told his team all week that this game was going to be a test for them. And really, even though they didn't win, I thought they showed a lot as far as how they were able to compete with uh, Division Four runner-ups. And I think that's a really positive sign going forward for that program that's struggled for the last 10 years. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it was going to be the fact that they, they, you know, they were competitive throughout. It was 14 mm -hmm. nothing at halftime. So they were in it. And they just could never really like get over the hump. Right. and maybe take that momentum it seemed like but yeah that's 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 a positive step even though they didn't win and you know again kind of leading you into this week's game with Coopersville they um that's another one that I think it's going to be a test but let's see some more positive signs maybe they can even pull that one out this week what's your thoughts on that uh, Mike I think Purport pulls out the close win over Coopersville I mean Coopersville is going up as a program too and I think that's going to be a really good game and Fruitport was able to get them the last couple of years, and I think uh, they'll pull away with a big win that's much needed before they play a really tough Spring Lake team week four. Yeah, Coopersville 2-0. and They beat Big Rapids 42-30, to and then Wayland 42 to nothing. But uh, yeah, I think Nate Smith's got... Uh, you know the uh, the Trojans believe in themselves, and they got a great quarterback in in the uh, Reams, uh, the Reams kid, and uh, so I think uh, I think they had some weapons this year. Let's uh, move on to the uh, West Michigan Conference, and I guess we'll start with you, with Scott. Uh, a game that we were all at, <laughs> all of us, uh, me with the Greater Muskegon Sports Network, and also uh, Catch uh, Catchmark uh, Sportsnet, and you with them live, and uh, of course M7. It was uh, Oak Ridge getting the better of Whitehall, 32 to uh, to 19. Yeah, they just I thought they won that game up front, Mike. You know, we were both there as you said, and I just thought that's where it was won. And they actually did a good job of distributing the ball to the mm -hmm. three backs. I didn't. Everyone knew about Corey Vanderput, but and then you look at Brendan Raymond. I knew he was one of their backs, but they had the sophomore out there too. I think he's a sophomore, right? Their, their third back out there, and he was he was impressive too. So they were actually kind of mixing it up really well and keeping. Whitehall, you know, on his, toe, on his heels, and they couldn't really settle in. Whitehall, to their credit, hung around, and it was a seven-point game, you know, into the fourth quarter, but they just couldn't get over the hump, and Oak Ridge, I thought, was in control, basically, throughout. I'll agree with everything Scott said, and I thought Oak Ridge played better than what the score was in the way that I felt like Whitehall came back on just some missed opportunities that Oak Ridge had, but really, throughout the game, I thought – they played like they were three touchdowns better than Whitehall. They uh, were able to run the ball effectively, like Scott said, between Vanderput, uh, Danachek, and Brendan Raymond. And Brendan Raymond's a player that we haven't talked about very much, and he had a heck of a game with three touchdowns and 72 yards, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what that trio does throughout the season. And they're probably my projected favorite to win the WMC as of right now. Yeah, you know, I went in thinking that it was going to be Corey uh, Vanderput heavy running because he's you know over 100 yards a week before. In fact, he winds up getting 100 yards again in this one. But boy, uh, Oak Ridge comes out. I think the first three plays, they hand it to Trevor Jones, and and he runs it up the middle. Then they get Raymond involved in the game, and then they get Vanderput involved, and then Danachek throws. And uh, that was the kind of the X factor for me. I certainly knew that Matt was was a great athlete, but I didn't know you know if 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 throwing was going to be a factor. But this kid is 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 heaving the ball and uh, man I'll tell you what that adds a whole new dimension uh, dimension to that team I have to say though I think there there's a missed opportunity there's the kid that might run the, the best on the team is the kid that's playing offensive tackle Ethan Joseph <laughs> yeah. you know he picked off that pass yeah. with those mitts of his right and all in one swoop kind of went and pressured the quarterback put his hands up and the ball just stuck in his hands and he was off to the races and the week before, he, he basically recorded the safety that won it for him yeah. in midway through the uh, fourth quarter against Sparta, which proved to be a really good win because Sparta w turned around and put one on Ludington pretty well yeah. this last week. So. Yeah, so he's kind of an offensive defenseman, I guess yeah, you would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah 6'5", 240, <laughs> and he can do that, those things. Yeah, that was amazing. He went up just to, I think, knock down the pass, and all of a sudden it's just like it's stuck. And then he's racing like 49 yards for Yeah, I bet he's going to be asking if <laughs> – 
<laughs> Coach, tight end, slide me over a spot, maybe. Yeah. Is there, yeah, is there some, uh, gonna, is there some uh, offensive time for me? Well, you've got, um, you've got Oak Ridge uh, this week. They are, they have a bye week. Well, I guess they actually, technically, they win by forfeit. I think you were saying against uh, Mason County. Is that correct? Yeah, bef- like late in the summer, I think it was when Mason County Central decided because of numbers, okay. uh, low numbers in different situations, they were not going to play Oak Ridge, Montague, or Whitehall. They were going to kind of do like a hybrid varsity slash JV schedule and just play some teams and not others. And But then after that happened, COVID hit their school. They had some kids impacted by that. So they lost games that they were going to play, like Manistee, mm-hmm. which I think they've gone on to reschedule. And then, you know, they were supposed to play Hart last week, but that's when Hart picked up Kent City. We'll get right. to that as well. But that's, uh, yeah, that was another game that they lost off their schedule. But. As it stands now, Mesa County is supposed to open its season early next week against Ravana. At Ravana. Okay. We'll talk about Whitehall in a second as far as who they play because it kind of ties into our next game. And that's Ravana taking it to Shelby. Shelby looks like it's going to be another tough year for the for the Tigers. But Ravana rolled up, what, 63-6, to 2-0. And, oh, and uh, Justin Eagles got, uh, got the Bulldogs uh, howling over there with uh, two wins in a row. Yeah, and they've looked really impressive so far, especially like we talked about last week with that win over Beale City. The real test for them, especially as far as WMC play, is going to be this week against Whitehall. I think we'll really get to see where, where they're at as a program. And I just want to say Kyle Beebe for uh, Ravana. He was 2 of 3 for 84 yards and two touchdowns <laughs> against Shelby. So <laughs> just wanted to throw that out there. Didn't throw much, but it was uh, pretty profound when he did. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, they got some nice athletes on that Ravana team. That's what I've heard from many different people. They, they're really really good in the skill positions if you get them in space that they can make some plays so that's the whole key like right. mike said you know when you face like the white halls the montagues and oakridges then that's what you're going to be running into it and that's really what football comes down to is sure if you don't have the guys up front you can't get the job done you're really not going to be doing much right. so that's that's going to be the key for them is how they can handle things up front and that leads us to this week's game. It's going to be the game that we're going to be doing on the Greater Muskegon Sports Network along with uh, Catchmark uh, Sportsnet through the NFHS. Um, it's going to be Ravenna taking on Whitehall over at, uh, at Whitehall. And uh, I guess uh, how do you see that one uh, coming out? Man, I, I think it, a lot of depends on Whitehall's injury status. I mean, I just don't know. It seemed like maybe one or two kids might have gotten dinged up. I mean, you, you get into the season, you're going to have that. Sure. A lot of it depends on the health status, but, you know, Whitehall, you, you, you kind of got to like them to bounce back. Being at home, um, and they're, they're pretty strong up front as well. But, man, I mean, that, that's a really tough one because, you know, there, there's been cases, there's been a lot of crazy games in this series in the whitehall Ravana game yeah. where you maybe don't, you're not expecting it and then ends, ends up some wild shootout or something. Right. So, I mean, Ravana's got the ability to do that, but I think all things being equal, I'd probably have to give Whitehall the edge in this one. You know, I honestly think, just like the muskegon Zealand west game, I'm going to go a little bit on the wild side and pick the upset. I'm going with Ravana. I think uh, they've really come around as a program over under Justin Ego, and uh, like you said, Whitehall has some injuries, and I'm going to go with them to start 3-0. And that's not a bad pick at all. No, I mean, it really isn't. And the thing is, their schedule sets up. If they can get that one, then they got Mason County Central if that game's played. I mean, right. it, it's, it should be, but then, then I think maybe Montague yeah. and then another – not another break, but another winnable game possibly, and then Oak Ridge. So I think the games are spread out in a way that if they can get one here, then that kind of sets themselves up for some sure. really good success, I think. Yeah, and I think this is a, a rebound game. It's got to be for Whitehall after that uh, you know, tough loss to Oak Ridge. They're not going to want to fall down again. I think Ravana's going to give them a battle. I would not be surprised if Ravana – how's this for hedging? <laughs> I, would be, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Ravana wins it, but I'm, I'm going to just, – just to make a pick, I'm going to say that, uh, that it is, it's going to be Whitehall winning this one at home. I'll give them the home, uh, home uh, discount, I guess. Um, and then you have Hart. Boy, like uh, Mike said, the alternative world there, 2-0. Uh, they defeat Kent City by the score of 32 uh, to 22 last week. Yeah, that was a game that they picked up late because um, they lost the Mesa County Central game. That game was mm. knocked out of there because of COVID, so they weren't going to be able to play that, and they were scrambling. Kent City already had an opening in the schedule, so Kent City agreed. They already had six home games, is from what I heard, so they agreed to go up to Hart and play it. And then we're getting updates, and Hart was all over them early. I'm like, Wait, is that score right? <laughs> and, I mean, credit to them. You know, Joe Tannis, their, yeah. their first-year coach there, you know, he's been – he was the coach at Orchard View, but first year at Hart. 
he's he said he really liked those guys and they're physical and they and they're, they're playing tough and they've got some athletes on the team and so far it's showing that you know I think this this week's the big test though. Yeah, and uh, like Scott said, they really surprised me and him. I mean, Kent City's won that league in the CSAA go or silver for I don't know how many of the past two years, but a bunch of them and. Really, uh, Kellen Kimes, their quarterback, was 3 of 6 for, let's see, uh, 95 yards and two touchdowns. Mm. I mean, he really had a great game. And uh, But one thing that I don't think enough people talk about is the WMC is one of the best co small school conferences in the state where you can be an average team in the WMC and beat some of the top teams in some of those other small school conferences, and that's what Hart showed. Yeah, yeah, we say that every year. I mean, once you get into the postseason, a lot of times in the West Michigan Conference, um, your your first couple of games in the in the playoffs are easier than what your the gauntlet that you ran through during the regular season. And and again, kudos to Joe Tannis over there with with Hart. They're they're certainly one of the feel good stories. They're going to have their work cut out for them against uh, Montague, who's uh, hungry after a big win over North Muskegon, 35 to uh, nothing. North Muskegon for the second week in a row, guys. Um, you know they played. Cam Catholic the week before, and you're hearing a uh, very close game, and, and, and they stayed with them for a half, but boy, the second half has just proved to be the downfall for, uh, for Coach Witham and, and uh, the Norsemen. Yeah, first win, first career win for Justin Dennett yeah. as head coach, and so that's always a, always a big one to get. Sure. But yeah, they, I think to me, and we said this last week on the show, that Edwardsburg, not that you can just throw it out, but I wasn't right. looking too much at that one. Even though the score got kind of out of hand, mm -hmm. you have to look more at how they fare against North Muskegon. And obviously, they were, took care of business in a big way. Dylan Everett had a big game, 175 yards on 25 carries, a couple touchdowns. And he kind of put up the stats that I think we all expected him to right. in, you know, this throughout the season. And, but that, that's a big win for them. You know, their defense, of course, set the tone, mm -hmm. keeping a North Muskegon team that can throw the ball around pretty well, right. keeping them off the board. Yeah, like I said uh, last week, you can't write off Montague after week one. I mean, I think Edwardsburg's the best team that program's played in probably five years. I mean, th th that's at least in my opinion, besides Jackson Lumen Christie in the 2018 state finals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they came out and dominated. And it didn't really look like Montague got that much going passing. But Dylan Everett had a really good game for him with uh, 25 carries for 175 yards and two touchdowns. And... Really, I think this week, I think this week, even though Hart's going to be really motivated and I think they'll come in with a lot of confidence, they could play with them for a little bit. But I think Montague's going to win fairly easily because I just think, you know, their line is one of the biggest in the conference still, even though they lost a bunch of guys. And I think that they have a really powerful running game. Yeah, I don't think uh, the slipper fits this week for, for Hart. They're going to run into Montague, who is getting things back on track after the Edwardsburg game. So I think uh, Montague will probably roll in that one. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's uh, again, it's one of those you know measuring stick games for Hart right. just to see where they're at. I guess we said that last week against Kent City, and <laughs> look what happened. But right, right, I, right. it's still, I think you're stepping up yeah. again in class, and that's no offense to Kent City. It's just Montague's just been that that spot as a program. Sure, you're stepping up in class when you're playing them. The Norsemen now uh, they're going to be playing um, Shelby. Uh, they've had two weeks in a row where they really matched, you know, toe to toe with some tough competition that first week. As we said, it gets out of hand a little bit in the second half. Uh, not going to be that situation, I don't think, uh, this week with Shelby. What are you thinking? Yeah, North Muskegon, the last couple of weeks, they're 0 2, but they've played two of the best programs, I think, in our area with Muskegon Catholic and Montague. And really, I would agree with you that North Muskegon's going to roll. I'd agree with that. They, um, this is one of those, quote, get well games, at yeah. least on the scoreboard, <laughs> where you. You know, I have yeah. a couple of rough games to start, but I just think it is. I mean, Shelby, you know, it's it's they're trying to get it back on track, and not real long ago they were winning conference titles, right. you know, which, you know, that was getting some photos, and then I went over to the Muskegon cast that game, and, and I just kind of followed up with the coaches, the Heights and the mm -hmm. Calvin Christian coaches afterwards. But, yeah, it was nice to for them to get that win and just get some of those good feelings again. You know, right. Van Parker's really – puts his heart and soul into that and he's just trying Absolutely. to get the community to support him and they actually did have the stands weren't packed by any means but right. there were some fans in there from both sides and then they had there's vehicles around the parked around the fence stopping and watching yeah. and people coming up and just 
you know, hands through the fence, peering through the fence, getting a peek. And that's just cool because, really you know, when, when the kids feel that support, it makes a huge difference. And there was, uh, is, so what's the deal with Wyoming Lee they have them this week? Is Wyoming Lee forfeit or is that, how is that all going to play I'm out? I'm not sure. Is that what, is yeah, that where uh, that stands with that, Mike? Yeah, Van Parker confirmed to me about an hour ago that it's a forfeit win for Heights. So, so they'll be 3-0, and which is going to be their best season in probably eight so, years. That's so the Willie Sneed years, right? No, they went 4-4 four and four the year after Willie Sneed, okay. and I think they had a 3-6 and six season somewhere in there. Okay. But, yeah, this is their best season in a, wh in a while, and uh, like I said before, I think this kind of confidence can really help them throughout the season when they get uh, into some of those tougher games in their conference schedule. Exactly. How about uh, West uh, Catholic and Muskegon Catholic? Uh, we, we thought that was going to be a tough one for yep. Muskegon Catholic and it proved to, uh, to be that way. Uh, Scott, 28-6, uh, it was West Catholic. Uh, uh, over uh, the Crusaders. Yeah, we, we figured that would be a tough one for them. Talking to uh, Steve Zerwan earlier in the week, he thought that maybe, like, if it got to a certain, if they could put up some points, that maybe the defense could hang hang in there long enough. And I think that was probably the case, actually. And But their, uh, Grandpa's West Catholic has Tim Kloska, who's one of, considered one of the best backs in the Grandpa's area, according to my M Live colleague, Steve Kaminsky. He, he went, ran wild in their opening game. And then against Catholic, he ran for 139 on 24 carries with two touchdown runs. And but you know he's about goes about 200 pounds or so, but he's right. just you know well put together. And sounds like West Catholic's on the rebound to maybe closer to heading back to maybe where they used to be as a program. Yeah, and I said the same thing last week that I thought it was going to be tough for Muskegon Catholic, and not because they're bad at all. I think that they'll have a great regular season and they can even possibly win some games in Division Seven, but. Uh, I think I just think uh, West Catholic's one of the best schools in the OK Blue and really one of the best schools in Grand Rapids, and they're getting there, like Scott said, uh, where they were under Dan Roan. And what the, the deal this week, they were supposed to play Orchard View, but obviously with Orchard View not having a football team, are you guys hearing, is there a, is there a, a game scheduled with somebody, or is it just an open date for them? There wasn't anything last I heard talking to the ADs. It's, from what I heard, it was they were still open. Okay. So I haven't heard anything. I don't know if you've heard anything on it yet. I haven't Mike. heard anything. Okay, so we'll consider that. And then I wanted to back up a little bit and do another OK school in Spring Lake. Uh, they took it to Zealand East by the score of 56 to, uh, to 21. Yeah, and uh, really it was just a dominating win for them from the get-go. I think it was 28 nothing after the first quarter and 42 nothing at half. It was a running clock for most of that game. And Christian Folkert for Spring Lake, 11 attempts, 211 yards, four touchdowns. I mean, that's a dominant game on the ground, and uh, I think they can be – at the top of that OK Blue that we just talked about. Yeah, Tom Kendra, who does obviously radio in the area here, and he, he was actually at that game, not broadcasting it, but he was, I think he was there in another capacity. And he thought that there's, Spring Lake's got a good eight or nine kids who are just good athletes, can do a lot of different things. And when you've got that, and then you've got those troop twins up front, those guys are just tanks up there. And you know those guys anchor the line. And they were looking for big things this year. And when when I was getting score updates on that, I wasn't expecting those big, big <laughs> things. But man, that was really impressive. That really sure. caught my eye. And I, I did the, I do the M Live Top 50 rankings. And actually, I, the ones I published today were going to be are going to be my last ones because I'm yeah. done this week with them. But yeah, I, I moved them up into the rankings into the, like the top 40 or something like that, just because I was that impressed with that win. Yeah, I saw you put a little spoiler in your uh, <laughs> Facebook title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the. Uh, in my apologies, the CSAA, I, I got some great work at home, uh, just like high school, and my best work was left at home a, a lot. And so I'm going to. This week, um, who do they have this week again, Mike? Who are they taking on? Kent, Kent City? City, Lakeview. They got Lakeview, which Lakeview's been down. You know, that's a game that Kent City should be another one where they uh, get yeah. well game. And then, you know, Hesperia, another one from the Silver. You know, they they took another tough loss, and you know they've got White Cloud this week. Which it's another alternate reality one, two and zero White Cloud. White Cloud's two and zero, which they picked up a forfeit win, which sure. was Lee. Yeah, and beat uh, Shelby Week One. Yeah, beat Shelby Week One. So then, but the the biggest 
the thing that caught my eye the most out of all the CSA was Holton, mm -hmm. what they did last week and how they bounced back because they took one on the chin against Hart, but as, as we're seeing, maybe that's, that wasn't such a bad thing. And right. Holton turns around and beats, beats Coleman, gets a nice comeback and gets a nice bounce back win. And Mike, I'll let you take it from here because I don't want to hog all the CSA <laughs> from you. But <laughs> So I, I've always said that weeks one and week two are always the hardest to pick because week one, you don't know very much about the teams besides what you've seen in practices and at scrimmages. And week two, sometimes you get the wrong idea. And I think that's what we got with Holton because we saw the Hart-Holton score and we're like, wow, I mean, great for Hart, but Holton must be really down this year. But then we see Hart beat the best team in that conference and then Holton gets a pretty convincing win over Coleman that won 61 nothing in their opener. So, you know, that really uh, mixes things up a bit and really doesn't tell you what to expect from those two teams. And even uh, Hesperia, I think, even though they're 0-2, White Cloud's 2-0. I still think they get that win over White Cloud. Um, Dave Smith gets his first win as coach of the Eagles, or coach of the Panthers. And uh, Kent City, I think I think they'll go with a dominating win over Lakeview. I think they're going to come out pretty upset over really the last two, two games. Even though they beat Nuego, they had a bunch of turnovers, and that was really close, and they had to come back. And they just lost to Hart. So I think they're going to come out firing on all cylinders and be able to pick up that win. And then the other division you got the gold division, the yeah. bigger schools. Fremont was Fremont lost to Big Rapids forty to thirteen, but it was a fourteen six game at the half. So they, they hung around for a while and then just couldn't you know, just couldn't hang in there long enough. But you know, they had you had a big game from Justin Dermeyer or Durheimer, excuse me. He had hundred and thirty seven yards on and two touchdowns and twenty four carries. So that's a really good really good game for him and so he put up a good performance and you know, that was a tough one for them. You know, this week you know, they got a, they're got hitting the road, I believe. They are headed to, let me check my magic schedule here. They are heading to Central Montcalm, which is 2-0. and So that will be another test for them. And then if you skip over Grant and Uego, both with first-year head coaches, at least in the high school level, right. um, you've got Nuego, you know, they, they're coming off a loss to Central Montcalm. And then you've got Grant coming off a loss to Reed City. Grant lost 28 to nothing to Reed City. And Nuego lost 29-13 to uh, Central Montcalm, but you've got two new coaches there, and they're both ADs at those respective schools, too. So they got a lot on their plate trying to get those programs back on track, and but also kind of coordinating sports and for their schools in a crazy time right now. Yeah, I'll agree with everything Scott said about the gold, except I will say this about Fremont, which is exactly what I just said about the silver as far as, <laughs> you know, weeks one and week two. I mean, week one, I thought Fremont looked impressive you know competing with Ludington and I'm like oh Fremont might be pretty good this year Ludington's always a good program and that was a that was a pretty close one and then you see Ludington get blown out this week by Sparta I think 41 to 3 and then you see Fremont get blown out so you know you really it's really hard to draw conclusions after week one you really have to get a couple weeks under your belt to be able to right see what's going on yeah, and I think the other team that we – jumping around here a little bit, Grand Haven, they, they lost to uh, Traverse City – was it Traverse City Traverse West? Traverse City West, yeah. yeah. And rather, rather handily, I guess, too. So yeah. kind of a kind of a little slap for them, I guess, after the win uh, at the start of the season. Yeah, that was um, – Traverse City West, they had a nice comeback win over Midland at, in the battle at the Big House in mm -hmm. week one. And then Greg Vaughn, their coach, who used to be at St. Francis, people might remember him when they play, had games against Catholic and right. – and th those types of maybe I don't know if, if he was coaching when Ravana played him too, but you know he's had some success at different stops. He won the Detroit Lions High School Coach of the Week award in Week One, mm -hmm. so you know he's he's trying to get them turned around. It's gonna you know great rivalry actually between them and Trevor C. Central, where Jack Sugars is right. you know helping his son Eric, the head coach there yeah. now. And now when those two teams meet, it's always a good one. So those are teams to look out for. But in, in Grand Haven, they hop into the OK Red now. They got Jenison yeah. at home this week, which. There are no easy games right. in the OK Red, but I mean that I think th it's going to be a tough one. I, you know, I think you got to give Jenison the edge, but Grand Haven, you know, if, if they want to make these strides, these, this is the kind of game where it might you can see this as an opportunity for them. I would give Jenison the edge as well, and I will say this: out of the OK conferences, if you especially if you compare the ones kind of in our area, the green and the red, I will say the green at the top probably has the best programs in the OK Conference. But if you look at overall, the OK Red is definitely the most competitive because 
you can be a uh, average or bad team and the OK green, and you can still win four or five games. But if you're if you're bad in the OK red, you probably won't win a game. If I'm being honest, especially in conference schedule. And so I think this is going to be a tough one for Grand Haven. And I really think they're coming along as a program, especially after that win over Puffer. But that Traverse City game was not a good sign, and I think they're going to have their hands full with Jenison this week. Well, as we get set to, to wrap up here, I guess we'll just go to kind of the parting shots for, for you guys. We'll start with you, Mike, with uh, M7. Where are you going to be this week? And, and your, your thoughts as we sign off. I'll be at Muskegon Zealand West, and I think that's really going to be a good game. I was torn between going to that or Ravana Whitehall, but I decided to go to Mus Muskegon Zealand West. And uh, like I said earlier, I think Zealand West wins in a close one, but really could go either way. And uh, this is the, the last uh, assignment for you with, uh, with M Live. The last dance. The last, uh, yeah, the last dance. And uh, I'll let you kind of reflect on that a little bit. And this might be my last show on Catchmark if I wear those glasses <laughs> again. If I start acting like a clown again, you know, it might be last everything for me. I don't know. But it's, um, you know, it, 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 I could go with a parting shot with that. I am going to have a farewell column for, for M Live okay. that'll come out. That's always gonna. That's those are always tough to write, just because you yeah. just don't want to leave anyone out. There's so many people that, you know, you've encountered and developed great friendships and relationships with, and so many things you've seen, you just can't possibly capture it all in one right. column. But, you know, my, one of my parting shots. So we'll take it back to the football side of things. Is if you look at what happened with Muskegon and Mona Shores, yeah, I mean the east side kind of took it to the west side a little bit, but on the bright side, at least I guess for Mona Shores is that. They wouldn't. They're not going to have to face Cast Tech, right, right. and they're not going to have to face King either. Even though they probably like another shot at them, sure. You know, so they pay back the other way this time. But, but their Division Two, you know, Shores being two, mm. you know, Cast Tech Division One, yeah. King three, which means Muskegon's going to have to deal with King potentially down the road if they get that far. And right. Division Three, I mean, that could be wild, wild, wide open. And I, honestly, Division Two could be that way too. I mean, you're looking at. One of the powers that's emerging, and it's no surprise, they got to the finals last year is, is De La Salle with Dan Roan, right. the Orchard View grad, former Fremont and West Catholic coach. He's, you know, he's got them rolling already. They, they come, they're coming off a nice win over River Rouge, and so if you're looking at Shores and potential long-term playoff road, that could be maybe way down the road seeing mm -hmm. them again. Exactly. Well, that's going to do it for us. Thanks for uh, stopping by. We'll be doing this every Wednesday, right around six o'clock hour, and. Uh, it's, uh, we're looking forward to it, and you support your local teams, and uh, we will see you again next week. For Scott DeCamp and uh, Mike Mikoff, I'm John Russell. Have yourself a great evening, everyone.